Hello and welcome back. Very quick intro here, just to say that um, a lot has been going on in the last two weeks. So what I've done is a bit of a compilation. been in the workshop uh, finishing off some nukes reinforcing the lugs and I wanted to show you what we do with our poly nukes we've been um, getting the apiaries tidied but also the main home apiary here has had quite a lot of work done in terms of we've replaced the staging which you probably saw me posting pictures of the new staging we made up they've been treated and now they're virtually in place uh, we've also been um, yesterday we've been going for the first hives and it was a surprise because they're all really really strong so we've got a lot of work to do, but the weather's been up and down. We've got night frosts and sunny, clear days. So the bees are flying like mad in the day. They're burning a lot of honey because they're trying to keep warm, but they've got huge populations now, the nukes. So this is when you've got to be really careful with them. But I'm transferring most of my nukes into hives, and I lost a few nukes over the last of early, part, early to late part of the winter. In other words, uh, November to January, then they... I lost a few then, so the ones that were, that were dead out, so I kept the frames of honey. So those nukes I'm transferring into hives have had that honey, because there's nothing wrong with it, it was just a, just a varroa issue again. But overall, my colonies are brilliant. We've got uh, probably less than 5% loss in my production colonies and about 15% loss in my nukes. So that's what I'm working on for this year to get my nukes down. But the good news is that the, the, the colonies that I treated against mites in January with when they were broodless with vaporized oxalic acid have done fantastically and they're the ones that are booming so I'm really really pleased with the results of the work we put in but anyway I'll show you a few different things we've been doing and uh, you'll get the idea but it's just all full, full on lots going on and uh, it's basically the season is here we're putting on supers next week but the problem is the weather's going to go cold so i don't know what to do i've got to put supers on because i've got brood hatching and the colonies is getting too strong yesterday i was taking out partitions from the winter that were supposed to be only just on seven to eight frames when they're actually on on 10 frames already they were almost they were trying to eat the partitions to make room in the colonies and the feeders were full of bees and you'll see that so it's absolutely fantastic news when my bees need space and we are at least two weeks early this year on last year and I don't know whether it's because I've got my varroa mites down earlier last year but I've always said a varroa control is a, set, is a two year cycle. If you get your mites under control earlier in the summer as soon as you've harvested your honey they go into the winter cleaner so then the following spring they're stronger and I think that's what's happened with me is I'm finally getting, under, getting my mites under control a bit and I'm realising now that it's so essential to put your time and effort into controlling mites. Like Randy Oliver says, if you spend most of your time concentrating on your mites, the majority of other things fall into place because mites are the key issue in a lot of the problems with your hives. So now you'll see what I've done, you'll see what we're doing, and I hope you enjoy the video. Here we are, first apiary inspections going on well, and what do we find first thing in the morning? This, and it's only the 27th of March. Ridiculous. So this is going in a box here. But at least I've got a box with me. There you go. All a bit of fun. Have a good day. These hives are a little bit strong, I think. I've left these couple of feeders on over the winter and uh, they are full. So it's fantastic. Well, they're all like this. <laughs> Ooh. So 
So now um, we've just had the sun come up from behind a cloud. It is a cool from the north, you can just see. And if you can see that we've just done some rearranging of staging and uh, tidying up. I've got a bit of help with me. This year he's down the back there working hard. We've been uh, tidying up all the apiary here, the home apiary, getting all the stuff checked. It's all above board and good, so it's a great start to the season. Now we're just tidying up, recentralizing uh, and repairing. Um, bee stands and everything, so we're nearly finished here. Now tomorrow we'll be off out to the out apiaries and doing all the bee checks there and starting to add frames, take out uh, the partitions from our hives. Basically everything's going really well. But while I'm doing this job here, I'm the one who gets stuck with planting out these trees, but I don't mind because I absolutely love it. Which is great fun. Just to think you've sown these trees, they're now going to be lined out next year, they can be harvested all the year after, and they'll be two to three foot tall and a young chestnut tree, which is the future as far as I'm concerned. We must plant trees. So here is the future. Future generations of trees. You might remember that I sowed some chestnuts a year or so ago. It was winter 2016, 2017. Uh, these are the trees that sprouted in 2018, last year. And uh, I grew them in pots. And here's the pots. So this is one of the jobs I'm doing. Getting these planted out. In a line. As well as everything else. So they're all going to be lined out. They are looking really nice. They're all just starting to burst their buds now. You can see that is uh, ready to go. You can pull it out by the pot usually. Get one out, it's going to come out, and you'll see there's a lovely root ball. The roots are actually pretty good. There you go, some nice roots on that. You can see roots right down to the bottom there. Plant that out. They'll get away well this year, and I'll keep them watered for the first few weeks because it's actually pretty dry at the moment. So uh, we need to keep an eye on the water in them, but they'll be fine. So we had the mower out today, getting stuff done really well, and we've got hives ready. And everything's looking pretty good, really. Uh, you might have seen I posted a few pics of me painting up some poly nukes, and they're all done and painted now. Now we're just finishing them off, and while we've got the chance, we're reinforcing them a bit. And we do this because um, I've got my colleague to thank for this. But um, what we do is we 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 use uh, a metal strip and we put a handle on uh, to reinforce the each poly nuke. And we found that otherwise, if you use the poly nukes without any prior reinforcement eventually the little lugs inside break down obviously they're daydont uh, or dadon as we call them here and what happens is the uh, the holly the polyhive start to get a bit damaged at the top quite easily so i'll show you what we do and why we do it these are some of the first polyhives i bought and we've used them for a couple of years now and you can see even though i've just cleaned them out and given them a bleach and a, a scrub um, you see the damage we get. See these lugs where the frames sit there, where basically they, they break. Because the, when you get a dead out or something like that, or you're in a hurry, you're not careful enough, they don't move and they, they tend to stick the frames to the inside of the hive. So you think, I'll just leave that out, and you end up breaking these little lugs off. Now these little lugs aren't anything special, but they are a guide and they do help stop, uh, they do help the spacing and everything else like that. So it's a lot easier to use the lugs than is anything else. But what we do then is we reinforce this so that the lugs can't break off. And it just makes it that much stronger. And you do it when you get them new and they'll last eight to 10 years, maybe more, if you just keep on top of them and keep them tidy and clean. So these are some, that are, there was a couple of dead outs that we had. And you can see that these have been reinforced and the difference is unbelievable. So there's no damage to the lug. And with the metal there, you can lever the frames out very easily and there's no damage at all. So, so this is how we do it basically. We buy these, um, these plastic pieces that, are, that form our handles. I don't know if you can see that right through there, but you'll see the screws inside that come through when we screw through the, the castellations. These uh, plastic strips, we buy them in long lengths and cut them up to the right size. What these are, these are actual uh, window seals when you put in double glazed units into windows. So they, uh, we cut them up, they're about, almost like a byproduct because often in window companies they have some spare and you just got to order them and keep them, ask them to keep an eye out for you. So you end up with a great handle on the outside and the inside protected. 
You'll never get damaged. Well, as good as never get damaged. And the castellations we buy are actually for dad on 12 frame hives. And all you do is order the 12 frame, cut them into two, so you've got six. So that there would be for a 12 frame hive, obviously lots of them. Cut them into two, and obviously there's one each end. So that's what we do. Reinforcing our hives gives us a good, a good nuke that will last a long time, and it gives it a handle on the outside. So uh, just a lot of things to share with you that we do that makes life a little bit easier. A bit of work. You see these are all painted nicely, all done. Just means I'll last that bit longer. So these are my Michael Palmer style double nuke boxes. There you go, 76, 77. One's got an entrance on this side. One's got the entrance on the other side. There we are. And uh, you can see how well they've ever winter because they're completely packed, absolutely packed full. So it does work, you know, we don't usually use them here and I made a couple, got one there and one at the end. 75 there, 76 the other side, but I, whenever I've used them, they've been great. It's just to say that we're going up with them already. So they're packed full, we'll put an extra, this one's just had the extra story added, so that's now five over five. This one's gonna be five over five, but don't forget they're date on frames, dad on frames. So they're bigger frames than your Langsdorf. So we've got quite a bit of room in there and that'll mean I can harvest brood from these as brood factories when I need to, and then I can use them as finishers. I put a queen excluded between the two, and I regulate the amount of brood in the top and the bottom according to what I need. And at the end of the summer, I take the top box off, and I make a nuke with it, or two nukes, and I take the, the other top box off and make a nuke with it, or two nukes. It's just so logical to do that. But we always have a winter on five frames here for my nukes, it's fine. And then in the spring, we go up again. But now I'm using loads of frames, and it's just incredible because uh, you forget how many colonies you have and then suddenly you're into using 200 frames a day and you're like, oh my goodness me, 200 frames. But there you go, we're done. So what we're doing as well is here, we're getting ready for the summer queen rearing and we're going on to our five over five. So this was a six frame dead on nuke that I brought in that you can see is really well populated. And this is how I make my five over five. So I'm going from six frames to ten frames but I can, always use, I can use a partition if I want to because this is packed with bees and honey I don't need to so this bit goes on top I've split the brood into three in the bottom and three in the top or, or something like that and the hive will stay in the same place but now we're going to transfer these into the top with two partitions in, with two foundation either side so the top frames top five sections now on and these are foundation and they're going to be building that out. This was a completely packed colony anyway, but not too bad, not too... You can see it's, it's come out cleanly. The, the hive it was in is still fairly clean. It's not actually, they've not been chewing it. So this is brilliant. This is perfect time for it to go up. So now we've got five over five. When I'm ready, I will sort out some brood from the bottom or the top and juggle it around, put the queen underneath and put a queen excluded between the two. And that's my finisher. Really strong, really nice bees. No problem at all. So this is what you get when you get a severe infestation of wax moth. There's a lot of beekeepers who wouldn't be very interested in showing you this and that's why you never see it very often but it's good to see this. I hold my hands up, schoolboy error. Last autumn uh, this colony failed. I knew they were queenless, it had a varroa treatment and it went into the winter. I didn't check it, I missed it and come this spring, it's th this was basically like this since probably November. So I should have gone and done it, but beekeepers are busy people and we don't always have time. So it'd be a great opportunity to show you this hive, to show you what, what the wax moth actually do. The wax moth are fascinating. There's two types, there's a lesser and a greater wax moth. This is the greater wax moth. And what happens is the, they home in on pollen, they home in on honey, and they home in on wax. That's why they're called wax moth probably. But what they do basically is that they'll lay eggs into the comb, in a colony that's not defended. I personally think there's wax moth larvae in every colony I've seen, but they never get away because the bees keep on top of them. But here you can see what's happened is they lay eggs in. It's actually not as bad an infestation as you might see because they haven't touched the bottom of the frames. They've only gone into the top. Now this is their webbing. It is a, it is a bad infection, obviously, but it's not completely destroyed everything. And what they do is they lay their eggs and then the eggs hatch out and they just basically munch for, they munch for France. They just eat everything. And then while the larvae is growing, they start burrowing into the wood and then they pupate. 
and when they pupate they actually seal the back of the frames in you can see what I'm pointing with the hive tool if you can see that where the hive tool is behind there they always get in there and the side you can see where I pulled these two frames out here there we are you can see that they've completely eaten that and they've they've eaten into it and they've also made their cocoons that is all cocoons or chrysalis that are that will hatch out very shortly if not, not hatching already that's what the the larvae looks like here we are there's one of the larvae there so I don't mind showing you this because all beekeepers get this every now and again but they just don't like showing you because they think that oh don't want to show that but this is real beekeeping this is what actually happens if you just forget something and a few weeks later you you're up to your eyes and I've seen my colleague the same he's had one in an apiary uh, last year exactly the same as this you forget about it for a few a few days and it seems like because you're so busy you put it to one side and you come back and it's just a disaster so what can I do with this hive? Well, really I'll probably burn most of these frames because they're just so wrecked. And you can see this one here. The frame has all been pitted, eaten out. It's just hardly worth saving. I'll probably melt it down, take the wax out of the inside, reuse the wax. You can see how they built that larvae look on top between the two. So there you go, there's, the, there's a good shot of the larvae. Now some have died over the winter, you can see, and some are still alive. But that's what wax moth do. They get in there and they wreck a colony. Now, I can, as I say, I can clean this hive out. The hive is absolutely fine. Even though they've eaten a bit into the side of the hive, it's not a problem. But it's just good to show you this because you understand how nature, these are nature's cleaners. This is why you don't see um, loads and loads of bee nests hanging around. The old nests get generally eaten up by, by mites by pollen mites, they get in there and they eat, eat the pollen, but also the wax moth home in on the pollen and they chew through all the nests. And then it just disintegrates and then the whole thing falls apart and then the nest is gone. That's why you don't see old beehives or bee nests everywhere. But it's just a bit of fun. This, this was a new colony last year, brand new hive. So you can see how quickly they move in if you give them the chance. I hope you enjoyed it anyway, just a bit of fun. You can see they've completely, that there so well I'll get my hive tool behind it, it's so well glued in that you can hardly get them out. And that's the problem, they, they wreck the frames and by the time you do get them out, you can't get them out because they're so solid in. There you go. This actually looks like webbing but it's their, it's their actual, what they spin when they're making their nest. I used to really freak out handling this stuff, I used to do my heading because it's like spider webs but it doesn't bother me now, it's just, that'll all be burnt, I'll burn all this. But, uh, there you go. I don't care, my, I don't mind sharing this with you because I think it's good to see and you can see what, the, what they get up to. Wax moth is our friend and isn't. <laughs> Have a good day. Bye for now.